camera that we collected yesterday? Yeah. Or Do you want to try grabbing it? Recent history? No. No. <laughs> uh, Habro Sedaris. Is that possible there? Circle it again. Set. Circle it again. No. Nope. Okay. Is this a starboard bio box rock? Do we think? Uh, yeah, probably. Okay. Current looks pretty decent here. Looking at a really low triclops camera moving along at a pretty decent clip. There's something att attached to the other side of that, something red. So maybe you can zoom in right there underneath the fingers. There's something red hanging on. Okay, for zoom. Can you just circle the entire rock? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a baby sea cucumber. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Baby. All right, let's go. <laughs> Everybody on three. Aww. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now let's put it in the box. There you go. Away. <laughs> that cucumber needs say about 15 to 20 centimeters? Uh, yeah, maybe if that, I would say 15 10 maximum. To 10 to 50? Yeah, 10 to 15. Mm -hmm. 10 to 15. So anything but the aft small port in the starboard box. So okay. One of the fir front, front three. Sounds Alpha, good. Bravo, Charlie. This is 122. 122. Yep. 122, aye. All right, so as we are starting this day off collecting rocks, yeah. our online viewers want to know, what can you learn from the composition of the rocks, Nick? So from the composition of the rocks, uh, we can determine basically what kind of rock it is. Uh, we, are, we have a pretty solid idea that these are basalts. Um, if they were more evolved, then they would, uh, and by evolved I just mean um, a magma chamber that is um, kind of melted over and over again. You'll have more evolved melts, which lead to more evolved rocks, uh, and, and those rocks will will differ in composition from uh, more, uh, more, less silica to more silica and uh, more incompatible elements, as we like to call them. Uh, so this is what we use to kind of identify rocks on a chemical basis based on their composition. Cool. Can't have any of those incompatible rocks. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have a new idea, though. I, I learned a new geology word that I'm super excited to use. Ooh. Uh, tell us. If I ever open a, a new age grilled cheese shop, it's going to be called Evolved Melts. The what? Nice. Evolved Melts. Evolved Melts? <laughs> <laughs> grilled cheese shop. <laughs> grilled cheese shop. New age grilled cheese. That's great. So what does that mean in geology parlance? Evolved Melts? Yeah. Evolved Melts. Um, Can you look straight down at the tether? So you start off... Give your tilt all the way down. You start off with a uh, primary uh, magma, which is uh, bread. something that melts the cheese. from the mantle itself. Uh, so cheese. you have the mantle, it melts, uh, <laughs> and then you have this primary magma, uh, cheese melt, yes. Uh, and that source will uh, kind of evolve from, oh wow, uh, it'll, it'll remelt, um, and then you'll yeah. have a more evolved okay, magma cool. uh -huh. uh, based off of uh, elemental uh, what's called the partition coefficient, and it determines whether an element wants to go into a certain mineral phase. And certain minerals are more, st more or less stable at different temperatures. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have basically an evolution of magma uh, from, uh, from these, what we call mid-ocean ridge basalts, which are uh, depleted in incompatible elements to uh, continental basalts, which are gonna be enriched in those incompatible elements. 
when I say incompatible elements, uh, I'm usually talking about there. potassium, uh, sodium, and a few others. It's a very odd awesome. Thank color you, rock. We all wait eagerly for Steve's restaurant to open yeah, someday I soon. Uh, I just want to greet So basically cheese, what though. you're describing is fondue. That's a weird looking fondue. Right there. <laughs> yeah, what's up with that rock? Rock does not belong. No, it doesn't. Huh. That actually looks like a more evolved rock. It's a cider and a cider almost. Mm. Yeah. We aim to please the Nautilus. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty large, but... I don't want it. He doesn't want oh. it. I don't he want doesn't it. Wow. want it. Almost Rude. no crust. Yeah. It's the first it time I heard that. It might just be mud. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> so, so tell, Nick, why don't, why don't you want it? What's wrong with that rock? Yeah. Um, that's a good, good question. I don't know. It just, it just didn't look like it, it is representative of the area. Okay. Um, so it's kind of just like picking something that's not going to tell the story of, of the overall seamount, I guess. So it's not good datable? You. Not datable, not you know. Not datable rock. Not datable, not, not compatible. Not compatible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't work out. Yeah. <laughs> it just wouldn't work out. <laughs> Some rocks, you know. Um, one of our viewers noticed on the previous watch, somebody passed up a flat rock. And what was, why, want, why don't you want any flat rocks? The idea is flat rocks are going to be crust um, if they're too flat. Um, and we've, we've seen that with some of the rocks that we've, that we've picked. Uh, but a lot of it is just more or less what side of the seamount we're coming up. Um, we've had, you know, relatively flat rocks that have been decent um, and by I say decent I just mean I don't we don't know whether or not we can get you know an age from them quite yet but um, they definitely have a nice enough basalt matrix for us to to grab them and make an attempt very nice uh, ET sponge on top of this rock at Vanna Magnifica something we haven't often seen on this watch but uh, as we know it's from Johnson Atoll area it's been found in the high tensities. cities the new species that was described just a few years ago. The last watch also saw one. Go for zoom. Science, do we just want to um, keep ship moves going? Uh, I think that's a good idea. Great. Okay, with that ROV? Yep. Great. Bridge now. You can push in a little more. Uh, Five zero meters, two seven zero. So again, what, what we're looking at here is a ET sponge. Yeah, that's you can right. Guess why? I think the first time I saw that, I thought it it reminded me very much of a little piggy's nose. Atlanta two seven zero heading. Yeah. Sweet. The the type locality for this species is actually in the Western Pacific, but it was actually found to have representatives sampled from a uh, cruise by the Okeanos Explorer uh, in 2017, I think. So it's pretty wide, widely distributed Go for zoom. animal. Nice parade sponge. Family Faria Day. Okay, go away. I've collected a few of those so far. Is that the sponge where when they are no longer living, they look like a backbone? Yeah, kind of like that. Yep. It's very interesting. Can we take a look uh, at the where this the kink in this colony at the end? Yeah. Go for zoom. Stop there. Okay. Nobody's home. Just looking for associations. Okay. It's just a bamboo coral, uh, unbranched. Normally we would, we would call this something like Lepidisis, but there's some, um, the genus Lepidisis has representatives in multiple clades, which suggests that it's, um, it's, not, a, it's not a good, monophyletic species. What does that mean? How can a, 
a species have representatives in multiple clades? Yeah, it's it's complicated. Um, but it basically means that uh, what we're calling Lepidisis today, is genus Lepidisis, is, doesn't have one common ancestor. It potentially has multiple common ancestors, which suggests that there's something wrong with the classification of that genus, and it needs a, a, a revision, a look at the material uh, to find additional characters that might help discriminate different um, different individuals and help refine the taxonomy to something more consistent. Gotcha. Go for zoom. Oh, there's something on top of that rock, yeah. Where are you looking, Steve? No, no, I'm, I, I was uh, looking at the triclops. Uh, but, oh, there's a, that might be one of those whale bones in the back, too. Yeah. Okay, go wide. Ooh. Say what? Maybe. This could be a sponge, okay, okay. too. Okay, all right. But that was a Chrysogorgia colony. It's very tough because, like you said, the, the backbone uh, Go for zoom. sponge <laughs> is uh, I think that's a sponge. Yeah. Deceptive. Deceptive, yeah. Yeah. I would go with sponge, too. Okay. Okay, so Keep I... Keep it going. Those tricky sponges. So in the chat, a viewer wants to know, um, does a thicker rock give you more layers to analyze? Not necessarily. Um, these rocks are igneous rocks, so that means they're derived primarily from the melt. Uh, they have um, kind of a unique and um, uh, uniform composition uh, throughout. Uh, sedimentary rock is going to be made from detrital sediment of previously weathered rocks through erosion and weathering. Uh, those will compact and cement over time, and that's where you find layered rocks, really. Um, we do see some layers here in, this, in these rocks, um, particularly with the ferromanganese crust being a distinct layer around the basalt matrix. And some of the um, volcanoclastics have some defined layers as well, as we've seen with the tiramisu and, and cake. Uh, looking rocks that we had from <laughs> yeah, one of the previous dives. Yeah, thanks for that translation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but um, as far as uh, our purposes for dating rocks, those aren't... Um, Not compatible. Let's take a look. Yeah. <laughs> Zoom at that white out. splotch. Yeah. We're looking for those more Yeah, I see what you're looking at. Speaking Beautiful of tiramisu rocks. and cake, it's ice cream day! Yeah, ice cream day! Oh my gosh. Goodness. Huzzah. 15 minutes. T minus how many hours? It took us 15 <laughs> yeah. minutes to get there. Wow, that's a beautiful star. Is that a mm. star? Yeah, it yeah. is. Cool. We actually sampled something like this last year, so it's not a sample target, but we'll get a good zoom on it. This is a type of sun star or solastrid, family Solasteridae, maybe even in the genus Solaster. And, um, Go for zoom. I have a question Interestingly, that it's, uh, just kind of sitting there. Are these usually a bit more mobile? Uh, yeah, we. Uh, this is the same genus we saw eating that Versinged uh, yeah. way back in you, dive one, I think. Or maybe do dive um, two. starfish of different species have a set number of uh, tentacles or whatever? What do you call them? Arms. Yep. Arms. Yeah, the the solastrids typically have more arms. Okay. okay. Yeah. Go wide. Logan, but can you go to um, channel Typically, they have the a five, five uh, radial symmetry. Do you have what you need? Yep. Pentaradial symmetry. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank, thank you. you. But solastrids can be uh, more complex. That one seemed uh, a bit on the small side for a sun star. Yep. Yeah, they, they don't get particularly bigger than that. Um, not sure. Maybe there's just not a lot of food supply. They're lean living on this side of the seamount. Maybe a bamboo corals are the only things that probably uh, are dating upon. Maybe okay. other echinoderms. Food is sparse here. And as Steve told me the other day, it takes years for sea stars <coughs> to eat their meals down in these depths. So. Really, really interesting. I've had a couple of those days. Have you? <laughs> yeah, we're a couple of like those years, maybe. A couple of those years. I have never. I 
I don't know that that struggle. Bridge now. Uh, five zero meters, two seven zero. Yep, more whale or uh, fake fake whale, <laughs> fake whale bone <laughs> sponge. <laughs> fake whale bone sponge. Big talus field here. Long name. Ah, oh, somebody in the chat says I'm getting an extra scoop of ice cream today. Yes. Thank you, chat person. I will it into existence. <laughs> I can just see you there scooping ice cream and <laughs> like, no, no, Brittany. Like, well, hold on. <laughs> the chat said so. <laughs> the, chat, the chat person said. <laughs> yeah, I'm a notoriously slow ice cream eater. Um, so maybe that's what me and the sea star have in common. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to enjoying it today, taking yeah, my time. Certainly. That's funny, you haven't mentioned that yet. <laughs> What'd you say? That's <laughs> funny, because you haven't mentioned it yet. No? Ice cream. Oh, yeah, ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I can stop oh, talking what? about ice cream. Oh, what? It's ice cream day? No way. <laughs> <laughs> We're all thinking we've, it. We've all waited too long. <laughs> 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 the real question is, what flavors of ice cream are we going to have I today? know, right? Big question. Or even the, the more real question, are you sure we're going to have ice cream today? Uh, Steve, uh, Steve, don't bring that energy in here. Oh <laughs> Somebody's got to keep expectations in check. <laughs> Do they? <laughs> Who are you, Steve? I don't know. I'm, uh, I, uh, it was the cruise with no ice cream. I know what it was. <laughs> yeah, no, that, seriously. I, do remember I know it hurt you. We ran out really, really early. We made yogurt pops instead. <laughs> You just froze the yogurt packs. I don't remember that. <laughs> stuck, <laughs> that is stuck spoons in them. <laughs> was sad times. <laughs> <laughs> the best of times. It was the worst of times. <laughs> There's an unbranched uh, stick coming up in this area. Okay, I see it. Uh, we'll take a quick look at that. In the chat, we're getting an excellent question. Um, if it takes years for the sea stars to eat its meal, how long do sea stars live? Uh, unclear, but you, we, we can make some assumptions. It's probably quite long on the maybe order of decades. Wow. Uh, Go for Zoom. All right. This beauty is a known uh, animal. This is Candid Candidella gigantea. It has uh, typically three, three-ish polyps per whorl. It's a primnoid octocoral. Uh, very easy to identify. Generally, the polyps don't retract either up or down axis. There may be a slight polarity in how they retract uh, and contract the polyps, but Go away. Um, it's a known species to us, and we've sampled it extensively throughout throughout the prim. Pacific Rhode Islands Marine National Monument. Always unbranched. Shrimp. Shrimp. <laughs> shrimp. Two shrimp. Two shrimp. Two shrimp. Where? There's a shrimp like right before the coral, right before we zoomed on the coral. Wow. Oh, there's a another shrimp. So in this um, area, let's see, I'm making a species list for this dive, Chrysogorgia spa, Steve, are there any, um, species on the sampling list that we haven't seen or collected yet for this cruise? Uh, yeah, a lot of them. Uh, oh, squat lobster, bottom side of this rock, right there. Oh. Lobster. Lobster. Oh, yeah, it's scurrying. It's a little skittish. Um, yeah, a lot of scientists ashore requested um, 
specimens from much shallower depths than we were anticipating uh, on diving for okay. the majority of this expedition, which was kind of known. And I mean, the only depths we would really okay. hit most Push of those targets on would be something like Johnson Atoll, which is not part of our dive plan, okay. our cruise plan. I see. Yeah. So unlikely to see them. Yeah. Cool. Uh, yeah. Okay. So cute. Go wide. I have two, <coughs> excuse me, two acronyms for uh, <laughs> lobster. Tell us. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> have you been working them yeah. through? <laughs> oh my god. That's great. I have one for lobster and one for lobsters, because that was easier. Uh huh. <laughs> so we can start with lobster. <laughs> um, it's lobster observation between touching rocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You can also say testing rocks. The other one is looking over Bacheroto terrain, <laughs> RV for squat lobsters. <laughs> wow. Nice. I like that. Nice. I like that you worked Bacheroto in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> These are looking pretty angular, though. Well, <laughs> Nick says, it speaking of rocks. It's <laughs> <laughs> more of a general feeling. <laughs> I love the. Th this is where this is the environment where the triclops camera really shines, mm -hmm. because you can see the the other dimensions of the rock that you can't usually see with Zeus. Mm -hmm. You get really low shot. Really nice uh, to see like right the there. fauna on the sides of the rocks. Yeah, those rocks that look like they're almost as excavated. Mm -hmm. They're. Uh, they're formed when uh, yeah. the rock oh itself way. cools, but magma is still kind of pouring out, so it's making another pillow basalt and uh, kind of calves off of that, that earlier formed rock. You can see it over here as well. Bridge, huh? Do you see any rocks that you want is the real question. Yes. Mm. We can add another mm. five zero meters, two seven zero. That is definitely a yes. Um, so we're we gonna sample? Sure. Okay. We can do that. Uh, anywhere? Yeah. Okay. I can find one. Whatever's good for you. Everywhere is pretty fine right now. I think we're pretty well set up. It's all loose. Yeah. Famous last words. You want to go ahead and pick one, Steve? Nope. We can call it Steve's Rock? Nope. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> nope. Uh, I can't handle that much stress. No. <laughs> uh, how about that rock? Yeah. Nick, when did your love of rocks begin? Tell us your origin story. <laughs> when I went back to school, I just had an idea that I might like geology. Uh, so I enrolled in one of the classes, uh, Geology 101, and uh, it's kind of a turning point for a lot of people once they start um, actually playing with rocks physically. Uh, you take a lab um, and you identify rocks. First you identify minerals, then you ident identify the three primary types of rocks, igneous, sedimentary, metamorphic rocks. This one, yeah? Um, or was it this one? I lost it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I was talking to Brittany. Uh, I think it was this one here. Okay. And uh, yeah, um, it's a really nice hands-on activity. Uh, and then you get to go out and um, do field work. Um, and you find some really cool rocks just out in nature uh, that is really exciting. Um, you know, just walking, walking in the mountains and you find a nice little geode. And, yeah, you know. that is really what cool. What do you think? <coughs> it's uh, pretty flat yeah. on that right side. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'll take it. Okay. I okay. like it. Okay. Okay, so start with the brow box. <clears throat> one of the That's front. One, one two, three. Two, okay. forward two smaller boxes. Yep, one, two, three. Two. Yeah, I'm definitely understanding what you mean with the hands on aspect. Um, being able to cut rocks myself while being on the ship is 
Yeah. They're really fun. And yeah, yeah, it's definitely increased my appreciation of rocks, I'll tell you that. So yeah. I get it. And there's so many different types of rocks you can find in different areas. And uh, some of them are, they're, they're just really wild. And you, you just sit and wonder, how did this get here? You yeah. know? And then it becomes a game of uh, detective with the planet as your, you know, as your study area. You're trying to figure out, you're trying to reconstruct all these different events, uh, one little event at a time. What was the size of that rock, do you think, Steve? Uh, I would say at least 15. 15 centimeter triangular rock. Yep. Flat on one of the edges. Steve, the chat is wondering if there are any updates about that um, mystery gelatinous creature that we just that we found yesterday. There are no updates. We we've been hypothesizing all day, and uh, it's perplexing. We don't know any narrowing down of the. I think the best the best bids are probably for tunicate or gastropod mollusk. But um, there is two firm camps on, on either of those. Mm, interesting. That's so exciting. Is this the new purple orb? Maybe. <laughs> Tell us about the purple orb. <laughs> Steve, were you on that cruise? Okay. Uh, I was not on purple orb, no. Oh. Do you want to talk that about that? That was the uh, <laughs> Dr. Lee Marsh, former, or oh, okay. former or recent science manager. Lee, come back out, please, please. if you're listening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, purple orb ended up um, spotted off of Southern California, and it w also stumped everyone. Actually, the quote, of course it was Lee. I remember the quote, because yeah. on the video she says, I can't even hazard a guess at Phylum. And <laughs> <laughs> we were all, familiar. Yeah. yeah, we were all shocked by that. Um, and yeah, it ended up Whoa. being... <laughs> that was cool. a really cool shot, it's the way it appeared in the triclops. Yeah, it's yeah. it very uh, dramatic. Uh, dramatic jump. <laughs> dramatic jump. Everything was, looks more dramatic in the cinema crew. That's true. <laughs> Thanks, Bronwyn. She what happened with stuff. the purple orb? <laughs> yeah, so um, the purple orb, uh, it, it was this translucent, gelatinous purple orb um, that was kind of spotted under a rock overhang. And we collected it, and it took months to determine, but um, it ended up being a pleurobranch, which is a type of sea slug. And I don't believe it was a new species, but it was a new color morph. Does that sound right? Uh, sure. I, I think last I heard they were doing some micro CT on it to try okay. and yeah refine. Micro CT. Micro CT, yep. Little little cat scan. Oh, oh, yeah, wow. it's, they've been they've been um, it's they've been studying it for quite a while. I remember it took a couple of years for wow. more information to come yeah. out of it, about it. Yeah, very cool. Looks like we're coming up on some more of that. I mean, if it is a gastropod, it makes sense. Usually, there's a lot of uh, actually. Hold up. Uh, can we zoom here? Do you have a second? Yeah. The base of this rock here. The base? Yeah, I don't know where that, there's a splotch there. Snap is probably fine. Go for zoom. Okay, it's just rock. Bridge now? Not just rock. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think Chris wants that. Rock. Uh, five zero meters, two so. <laughs> Actually, standby bridge. Um, science, I think we're going to drop down to waypoint seven around now, if that's okay. So, turning south? Yep. Turning south, yeah. Yeah, this is a very nice like terrain. Uh, boulders and peaks. Great. So, this is, this is a good good place to lateral. And it looks like, uh, it's on the sonar at least, the cliff. Let's drop off. Okay, so uh, ROV will be doing a 
let's say two zero zero. Two zero zero, Roger. Bridge now. Uh, five zero meters, two zero zero, please. Someone in the chat says, my very favorite comment to hear from science is, what is that? Yeah. Go for Zoom. Really exciting. Followed by, poke it with a stick. Poke it with a stick. Poke of science. <laughs> Speaking of, what is that? Hmm. It's some kind of shell or Go test. It's filled with sediment. Not living. So again, we are down here exploring the deep sea. Our current depth is 2,242 meters. So there's a so lot down here that has not been explored. And uh, Steve, you gave me an estimate the other day about how many new species you think that we're finding each year. I forgot what the estimate was. Um, it, it, it's it's uh, variable, uh, but at least in the coral world, it's probably on the order of 10 or 20 for deep sea species. But um, there was a paper that came out recently by some uh, scientists who were studying animals in the Clarion Clipperton zone um, east of here, by a ways, uh, that suggests that there's potentially up to 5,000 species that have yet not yet been accounted for in that area of the eastern Pacific. So it's very patchy, uh, depending on where we're studying, where we might find new species. But, you know, we, we only have the tools that are available to us. For example, you know, we're sampling macrofauna and megafauna so our ability to sample is only at the higher end of the body size spectrum. A lot of sediment on these rocks over here. Yeah. Interesting to wonder why. Nick, somebody in the chat wants to know what does an average day in the life of a geologist look like? Walk us through it. An average day of a geologist. So we have field work and we have lab work. And uh, depending on what your special speciality is, uh, you could be doing more or less of either. Uh, but it usually involves uh, some kind of sampling process, which is what we're doing here. Uh, our first step in uh, kind of identifying what's happening with the rock. Um, also include a lot of mapping, uh, whether it be uh, field mapping, or in our case, under underwater mapping uh, with uh, side scan sonar and other techniques. Um, another large part of it is um, geochemical analysis uh, to determine um, event ages, durations, and uh, periods of time. Uh, for example, we were talking about those drop stones the other day. We could kind of use uh, radio, uh, excuse me, um, cosmogenic nuclei to. Uh, to kind of put an age range on the time of that drop stone emplacement. Barnacles. So, uh, barnacles. Could be a little bit of a uh, little bit of office work, a little bit of field work. It's a nice change of pace. Okay, go away. Both worlds. Yeah. Do you consider time at sea uh, field work yeah. or office yeah. work? Definitely field work. Even though you're also in an office sometimes. Yeah, it's a, it's what I my my kind of field work. <laughs> yeah, uh, most geologists they're going to go out, uh, they're going to map a landscape, they're going to collect samples, uh, okay. take descriptions, snake, keep uh, a journal. Um, Atlantis started to go geologic a little maps bit are, two are zero big, zero. but uh, of course we can't really do around. geologic maps yeah. in the ocean and. Um, there's really only one composition of rock, uh, which is basalt, uh, and sometimes gabbro, which is going to be uh, the same composition as basalt, but it'll be uh, larger crystals, visible crystals. 
So if you ever see like a dark granite countertop, that's actually called gabbro. Um, gabbro? Yeah, G-A-B-B-R-O. That's your gabbro. new word of the day. Can we um, look a little bit more upslope on high pack, uh, just to see the where waypoint eight, sure eight and nine are? Okay, good. There we go. Beautiful. And somebody online wants to know: Has there been any discovery in new rocks? It's a good question. Um, I think I, I think that there's a, a constant uh, uh, under re re not re understanding, but a constant evaluation of rocks that are kind of evolving our understanding of what rocks uh, look like and uh, more or less the history of the of the region rather than the rocks themselves is the story that, that the rocks are individual rocks aren't going to tell a story by themselves, but a collection of rocks in a certain area, um, you know. Uh, that's one of the reasons we're taking rocks at different levels of these seamounts. Um, oh, can we look uh, here? Sorry. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I don't know what that is. A sea pen or a black coral or something? Well, there have been either way, we may want to collect it, so just give me a heads up. Okay, there have been some seamounts in the past uh, that have had different ages on the bottom and different ages on the top, which have been evidence of different hotspot tracks using the same location um, to oh. to volcanism. Go for zoom. Yeah, I think it would be a good idea to go for a collection on this. Um, okay. It's probably attached to a pebble. Um, so if you grab a clump, clump of nuggets, okay, go wide. you might be able to get it. Or, uh, or snip. Snip? Okay. But Didn't preferably push. lower. Okay, as low as possible. Yeah, like a little bit more than halfway, maybe, or about halfway. No problem. You don't mean to just take the whole thing, or? Um, no, we should try to go for a snip, but it'll probably come up because it, the, those nuggets are not hard on the ground; they're they're loose. Okay. So it may pull up anyway. So just see what you get. Um, and this is going to be a snip and slurp. Um, yeah. Let's see what comes up. Okay. If, if it comes up with a nugget, uh, which I think it will. And we'll just put it in the forward box. Okay, sounds good. This is a black coral, um, unidentified as of yet, but probably uh, maybe a heteropathies or um, or parenthropathies. Beautiful. Super. Thanks. Okay. No nugget. So slurp jar? Sure. Okay. Just gonna run flush real quick. Yeah, thank you. And, and what's we'll our jar number? Two. Ready for section? You have you have forty percent. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Can I get a little bit of zoom, please? Thanks. Beauty. There you go. It's in the jar. Cool. Well, 
Well done. So, Steve, what was the reasoning behind collecting this particular sample? Just a second. Okay. Can you repeat that? I said, what was the reasoning behind collecting this particular sample? So, we have a number of black corals and, and corals more generally that are poorly known from this area. Um, Corals have been relatively rare here, but they're characteristic of these sites, nonetheless, particularly of these um, nugget fields. And so we want to be able to identify that fauna. And so we took a representative specimen and left behind some material uh, to regrow. Uh, in this case, we can allow you know, our scientists on shore and uh, on the ship here to make tentative identifications and that material will be, will be uh, useful also to other scientists on the shore uh, who may be doing biodiversity studies for black corals and other uh, groups. It's one of the most requested, um, corals generally are one of the most requested uh, animals for collection yeah, because they yeah, not only so are um, create structural habitat for animals on the seafloor, but they also um, uh, can have a multiplying effect on the biodiversity present in, in an area. Can we zoom on white stick there? Yeah, sure. Go for zoom video. Very young, unbranched bamboo coral. Okay, go white. So Steve, is there, um, on our way to waypoint seven, are we looking, in waypoint eight, are we looking to make those moves in just direct lines, or are you looking to, to move through these contours in any other way? Yeah, it, same kind of thing, just avoiding downslope so we can arc Great. through the contour if needed. Okay. These are some really interesting sheet flows with uh, channels. It looks like scouring in between them. And I wonder if it's channels themselves or if it's just contraction from the lava cooling, similar to what you would see in like a columnar basalt, um, but just on a larger scale. Columnar basalt? We haven't seen one yet. We usually no, see we at least once per cruise. I would, I, would that. I would definitely be excited to see some. <laughs> we usually see them on the very steep portion, so maybe upslope there's some. And this is the area that we saw the really, really stunning red, uh, cliff. I'm going to take that turn out small. and see well, if it keep makes our a how this is laying. Okay. Science, anything uh, else you want to do here? You're fine the way you are. Uh, okay. I think we're good in the immediate area. Great. RV, it looks like you're working out a wrap, perhaps? Yes. Yeah. Great. Let me know when you're ready for a move. Can you tell us a little bit more about columnar basalt? Yeah, columnar basalt is a very interesting geometric pattern um, that is created from cooling basalt um, that kind of contracts uniformly and uh, it really and it makes these kind of like pentagonal and hexagonal shapes oh, yeah. um, that you'll see if you if you google I think it's giant steps um, mm -hmm. is what it's called and I want to say England Causeway. or Ireland uh, but they're just yeah giant's causeway thank you uh, and oh, yeah. they're just this beautiful um, otherworldly looking um, geometric shapes that are that are just made naturally um, from from cooling lava uh, as it rises at a at a I certain rate better. so it's a it's a decompression and a and a cooling mechanism very very interesting yeah, yeah. And they're always they're always found in those hexagonal shapes right like no other no other shape yeah um, yeah you won't really or see like, yeah shape. yeah um, triangular um, or anything um, I think it's very unique good and very now. interesting you also see them up in uh, the uh, Columbia River basalts. Can you look uh, a little bit? Right the way down, Tuan. Uh, go all the way back. Just go for it. And see if we can see anything. Uh, sorry, the other way. Uh, it'll look, it looks like it'll look backwards just a little bit. Give it another tap. So for our online viewers just joining us, they're asking for updates on the, uh, the mystery blob that we slurped yesterday. Um, yeah, we're still working on it. Okay, um, cool. Steve mentioned a few minutes ago that 
there are all kinds of scientists that are taking a look at it and they just haven't really reached a consensus quite yet. Might take quite some time yeah. for that to happen. Lots of different methods in order to try to narrow down what it might be. Yeah, we're and discussing Karen, doing busy, a, running a barcode on it when we get it back to the museum negative one wrap, um, negative at the end of the cruise. One and a half wraps in that will tell us, uh, give us a genetic fingerprint and allow us to okay. compare it to some something closer, closely dark. related. So that would really refine you know, where it might lie within the tree of life. Negative one and a half. Uh, we're still on 200 ROV. 200, roger. Although it looks like uh, we've got our cliff again. Got what? We've got our little cliff here back. Yeah, we definitely don't want to go too far down this cliff. Uh, what are you thinking about? Well, two zero zero. What are your, is your heading right now? My two heading zero is zero. two three eight. Two three eight. All right, Nick. We have a question about nuggets. You ready? Go ahead. <laughs> um, could nuggets be created by <laughs> implosion and events? I wouldn't think so. Uh, you know, for implosion, I think you need to have some kind of difference in, in pressure that's... Uh, Go for Zoom. <laughs> Hi, Dad. How's it going? I see you in the chat. <laughs> uh, no, I think uh, implosion is going to require uh, a large mm. difference in... in pressure, and I'm pretty sure that the pressure of the rock is equal to that of the surrounding uh, depths. Um, it's a little bit beyond my understanding, but I, I, okay, I don't no think I. that there's any evidence of, uh, of that kind of formation of these rocks. Um, more often than not, the rocks will be a uh, crust that's formed on an existing rock, and in deeper depths, they will nucleate on individual little stand grains and make nodules. Um, the, the nuggets uh, are still kind of uh, poorly understood, um, but I don't think that they would be caused by an implosion. I could be that. wrong. I see you, science. The okay. circle of science. So this wasn't a cliff. This was just a... What's that? This was not a cliff. I was, I was worried that we were back to the steep cliff, but this is just a... Blurp. <laughs> A knoll. Go for zoom. Oh, it's a Walteria. Skinny Walteria. That's nice. Okay. It's probably has some polychaetes in there. Oh, did you want uh, more imagery of the polychaetes? No, they're they're very obscured. Okay. That's an interesting slab ahead. What's that? That's an interesting angular slab. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this view is really telling a story for don't, sure. Don't give them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I already no thought slab. about we it. We could sample that. I was just thinking, like, there's got to be a way. There has to be a way. Science can make it happen. <laughs> there's a smaller slab right on the lasers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Take that one. Yeah. Okay, okay here's going some in. of these rocks are uh, <laughs> have a pretty pretty substantial sediment veneer, and some of them don't. Mm -hmm. It's very unusual. <sighs> Unclear why. I would imagine most of it is current related. Uh, Does our um, track take us over this uh, sediment slope in the forward front of us. 
uh, it will, if when we turn two zero zero, it okay. uh, is still there. So I think so, yes. Okay. Do you want that? Yeah, that's fine. Great. Uh, can I get a Doppler reset? Sure. So I would call this a sediment field with, I don't know if we'd call those nuggets or just sparse. A, yeah, very yeah, sparse nugget. Crust. Yeah. Crusty nuggets. <laughs> Best kind. <laughs> Crispy. Crispy nuggets. Crispy. Crispy, crunchy. A few years ago, uh, yeah, I guess it was a few years ago now, um, we were exploring a ways north of here and uh, happened upon these depressions of what looked like crusty flakes and um, they actually were accumulations of pteropod shells that had thin veneers and iron manganese coating. Yeah. Oh wow. And it looked like like frosted flakes, but black and manganese coated. And uh, we couldn't figure out what they were for the longest time until we sampled them. Interesting. It almost looked like just flakes or shards of crust, but it was uh, this biological substrate eventually. That's really cool. I'd like to see what those uh, nodules look like, the true nodules that you'll find at the, at the ocean depths beyond, you know, the carbonate compensation depth, uh, where you don't have too much sedimentation overall, um, so, uh, Rich, no? or too much current activity is either. Mm -hmm. So you just have little little nucleations on individual grains, and uh, they'll yeah, be a little bit more concentric. Zero zero. Um, just would like to see what that looks like uh, in front of a camera. Someone online is wondering if someone finds a brand new species or previously undiscovered creature, who gets to name it? Steve. <laughs> Steve no, gets all. that's not correct. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> so what they're describing is basically known as the field of taxonomy, which is the, the naming and describing and differentiating of, of species. Taxonomy and systematics, they're often linked. Um, and so it typically is, uh, the name is, is the very last thing that happens in a description process. And it's usually um, the describer or the, the author or authors uh, who get to determine the name. But there is a very um, strict code that they have to follow for naming. Uh, particularly in Latin, but uh, there's certain restrictions on how names can be used and proper uh, grammar. So if you're interested in that, I urge you to check out the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature. They have a website with all the restrictions and recommendations for naming. And you would identify a species uh, that might be closely there. related primarily by DNA? Yeah. Yeah. We might take a look at a couple things here. Um, front row. We're just going to take a look at a couple things here, yeah. at least. So first there. So there's two white oh, like splotches. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. maybe any tighter that's back zoom right there okay uh, it looks like a small barnacle okay go away and off what to else? the left hand side far left of the frame is a coral here crazy gorgia uh, yeah we'd like to get a tight zoom on okay i'll have to pick up for that It's 
speaking of taxonomy, did y'all see that um, for some reason people keep naming snakes after Harrison Ford? <laughs> it was like, I forget the genus, but there was some like new species of snake named like Harrison Fordy, and he... It's because of Indiana Jones, right? Yeah. But he came oh. out and he was like, I bake on the weekends, like, I literally sit in my living room and sew, like, I don't know why you're naming me after, naming a bunch of snakes after me. <laughs> That's awesome. That is a cool rock. Yeah, it's like a rock and a rock. Mm -hmm. Nice. Squat. Squat Christ is working here with uh, at least one Europtychus crab. Okay. And what? It seems like there's something the one. under the rock, too. Yeah, the rock's loose. Yeah. Are you talking about the, the rock? Talking about the red. Talking about whatever's red, red sitting under the yeah, crest. Yeah, the shrimp. Oh. shrimp. I don't, um, shrimp. depends okay. on what's going on with science here. All right, let's uh, keep going. Okay, going sounds good. Sounds like we're I'll keeping on going. Rock, yeah. mm. That was an example of a evolved, uh, no, no, rock rock. evolved rock. No, no. you're not going to see those in the, in the underwater. Roger. It was an interesting outcrop, though. It was. Chat wants to know, have you ever seen or heard something you still can't explain what it was? In life or on the ship? <laughs> <laughs> All the time. <laughs> There's so many things I just don't know what the heck. Um, yeah, anybody who's been out multiple times on these cruises, is, is there anything lingering where you're still like, I just absolutely don't know what that was? Yeah, my first research cruise, um, or my first cruise on Nautilus, I thought I saw a cannonball it was not a cannonball. It was a coconut, um, <laughs> but I'm pretty sure it was. It, it was more than a coconut when I saw <laughs> it, and I just I, I can't get it out of my head that we didn't poke it. What is that? Was it covered with a uh, ferromanganese? It, it was a little so rusty. It looked like a cannon. It looked cannonball. like a cannonball. Yeah, but more than a coconut. I How mean, this was in 20, <laughs> 20 uh, 2013, so highly unlikely. <laughs> where? Unless unless there's still. Pirates of the Caribbean out there. So where, yeah. where was this? This was in the Cayman uh, okay. Cayman Rise. In the high seas. In AO 3, oh. 4, or 3, 2. And it never got poked, so we'll never know if it nope. was a coconut or a cannonball. Yep. Mm. This but is but I, had to, I got my revenge uh, <laughs> <What>? last <laughs> cruise on the NA-149 when they actually did find a coconut on the seafloor, oh. and I did bring it up. How that's does true. a coconut sink all the way down? Like, that's, that's awesome. That's yeah, a good I question. how long that took. Because it, it still had fluid in it, like mm -hmm. coconut really? juice. Wow. Because coconuts mm -hmm. are floaty, right? When they Super floaty. They're supposed to be floaty. Mm -hmm. That's how they get their seeds to other places. That's oh. a oh, really? evolutionary disadvantage to sink for a coconut. Right. That was a bad coconut you found. Might have been dropped by a uh, swallow. <laughs> <laughs> An African or a European yeah. swallow. <laughs> <laughs> Two uh, like Monty Python references. Oh, man. Two it's been a long time. Two Monty Python. Wow. I'm impressed, yeah. Dick. Good job. Thank you. I think that was particularly clever. <laughs> We're on a roll today. More than a coconut. I feel like that should be your album title, Steve. <laughs> it's really funny. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how to top that one. Yeah. <laughs> What's the what's the band name? What's the group name? Crip Force Nine. The group name? Crip yeah, Force Steve's. Nine. <laughs> I thought he was a solo act. Oh, for oh. Steve. Yeah. Steve, Steve and the Steve Stars. Yeah, I mean he's talking about all of these songs all the time. The Squat Lobster song and the other one. And Steve and the Sub Aerials. <laughs> Yo, <laughs> the Sub Aerial <laughs> Steve. Steve and sub the Sub Aerial. Sub Aerial Steve and the Sea Stars. <laughs> the Steve Stars, sorry. Steve, Steve Stars. <laughs> I love that, Steve Stars. Oh, that's good. <laughs> He's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> In case anyone was wondering, he is smiling. You're getting close to breaking, here. Steve. 
That's my defense mechanism. <laughs> Smile. Smile. Could be worse. <laughs> no, it can't. <laughs> I don't have a watch name, y'all. No. It's been a long time. Three weeks? Yeah. And, like, we've had some good possibilities. Yeah. We'll just keep moving through this. Uh, uh, oh, uh, 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 no, it's a cucumber. Never mind. Okay. The unstevables. <laughs> what? <laughs> Gabby, bro. Oh, Gabby, love that one. Great. <laughs> China all, saying you, you should open a second me. restaurant and call it more than a coconut. So you have that. What was your first one? The uh, evolved melts. Evolved, evolved, evolved melts. melts. Evolved and then melts. you got more the, than a coconut. The, the more that goes on, the more I think. That's the right thing to do. Yeah, I thought you were Follow your heart, Steve. <laughs> Always. <laughs> Actually, like, Evolved Melts could be a pizza place, too. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the expansion <laughs> idea. <laughs> Grilled cheese and pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> New restaurant. I mean, what would you rather be eating, right? Honestly? <laughs> Honestly. I'm with you. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I will say there was this... There was a grilled cheese place by my house where I grew up, and it was my favorite spot. And it was like creative, amazing little grilled grilled cheese, and it didn't make it, and it was so sad. So the market's there, Steve. You can you do better. You just gotta believe evolve. In you. you just. <laughs> okay. Do we want to pass Waypoint Seven on the west or east side? Uh, the upslope side. Upslope side. We Even better way to say that. Well then, we'll do another Daddy. two zero zero. It's a yeah. Bridge. So there's a question in the chat from we somebody who said that two, they have been zero told zero. to not go into the science into the sciences because they're bad at math and bad at writing. And I am so sorry to hear that. That is not nice. Um, I feel like that's all scientists really do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, math and writing is very, very important when it comes to doing science. But I would say that there are multiple ways to get involved in the science realm. Um, so. I, myself, am a science communication fellow here on the Nautilus, and back at home, I am a, a senior educator at the California Science Center in Los Angeles. I do happen to have my degree in um, aquatic biology, my bachelor's degree, but yeah, I think that it needs to be said that it, it, there's a space for much more people in science than I think the general public uh, gets the idea of. So I just want to encourage you, like even if you're maybe not so great at writing now or, or doing math now, I wouldn't say that's a hard no and you should just give up. Um, I would also say that um, being told at various times in your life that you're not good at math or not good at writing mm -hmm. um, is nonsense. Yeah. yeah. Um, you, sh you should not listen to people who tell you that. Yeah. I can think of several examples in my life of people who are close to me who have been told that and kept out of math and gone back later in life and gotten like PhDs in mathematical fields. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's just nonsense. I agree. I wouldn't be discouraged by, by any type of negativity. And if you personally think that you're not good at those subjects, work your tail off, uh, you know, practice math, practice your writing. Writing is, is a skill that is, is ever evolving, especially once you get into the level of research. Um, it's a learning process, but the more you do these things, the, the easier they get. And um, yeah, just if, if you have a passion for science, um, I would definitely say go for it. Yeah, I think the passion is a humongous part of this. Um, I said this before in a previous uh, dive, but 
again, putting myself on blast. In the university, I took a deep sea biology class and I did not pass that class. <laughs> but yet, I'm still here on this ship. Can we see him here? I don't know if any of my classmates are on this ship <laughs> or if they've ever made it on, so haha. -ha. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so there's, don't, don't let that discourage yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. You though, never know. Yeah. I'll say too, sorry, I, I misunderstood the question. Um, I thought they were saying like, that's all scientists do. Scientists do so much more than that. Yeah, and I sure. also completely agree as someone that was, uh, um, we are, I think, I oh. think we're looking at this little white thing here. Sorry. Yep. It's in a five, four. Okay. Wow. Cool. Good eye. Really? Right. Quick what screen grab of that and Jeez. we'll move on. Let me know when Okay. Okay. Is that good? Yep. Go away. Okay. Xenophia 4, it is a single-celled uh, protist, foraminiferin, foraminiferin, and it makes these houses by agglutinating sediments to the outside of its cell. Well, um, but yeah, someone was told that like math wasn't my thing. I then ended up doing like a majority of the statistics from a master's group, and like nice. There's also just different. I feel like. Um, both teachers matter and within different subjects like you'll find your strengths because I actually math didn't click for me until I got to calculus because then it was like actually um, real world I like needed a connection I was like all this abstract algebra stuff that I just have to memorize like I don't really it doesn't click in my mind like science does because science feels real and interesting and relevant and math never did until I got a little farther down and then it all made sense. So, I agree. Yeah. Don't listen. <laughs> nice. And everybody's a good writer. It's just how much you write. It really is. You have to r keep writing every day. Yeah, Couple I think sentences. everyone on the ship would feel pretty strongly about this question. Yeah. And encourage you to um, that showing up and making an effort can go a lot farther than um, you know like expert proficiency in, in whatever area you're interested in uh, we all have really different paths to get here but a common thread is just persistence and um, putting in honestly like putting in the work and if it doesn't work out the first time keep keep trying keep practicing and um, keep trying to make new connections and if you do you know find a connection that results in an opportunity showing up for the opportunity and, and giving it full effort um, if, if you're interested in kind of the the different roles that are on Nautilus we also have on the Nautilus Live website um, under the team page we have career pages so you can see the different roles on board and the very diverse pathways that that could lead you there um, it's not always a linear like I'm going to do this role and take X number of classes and X number of trainings and get there. And we all have super different paths, winding paths to get there. Thank you all for chiming in. Yeah, so whoever wrote that comment, keep on keeping on. And we have other people in the chat who are saying the same thing. So I hope that you're finding some encouragement in that. Now. Uh, let's do five zero zero meter. Oh, sorry, five zero meters two zero zero. <laughs> I don't need a five hundred meter move right now. <laughs> no, please. <laughs> <laughs> no stops. <laughs> We're going all the way to the end. <laughs> Can we uh, pan down on Hypac a little bit to see sure. nine? What you thinking? I'm gonna might want to deviate a little slightly after we get to waypoint eight, because okay. uh, I, I think that these um, kind of scalloped cores of the seamount side are a little homogenous. Um, okay. So when we get to eight, we'll kind of aim to go up, up, up slope after that. 
Parker. Can you do some pointing for yeah. me, Sam? Yeah, so we're going to do uh, waypoint 7 to 8 and then directly upslopes to you. Yeah, so that, yeah, like that. And then we'll mit lateral along the, the top okay. down to 9. Yeah. Okay. You can yeah, so instead of lateraling up, the slope will just go straight up. Yeah, you can put like an 8B eight, eight or 8A eight, eight up okay. the, yeah, there. Yeah, so there ish. Mm. There ish. I hope so, yeah. I'm gonna go laterally along to till at least eight and then you know, and rather than go this way, we'll just yeah. go up like that. So that we get a little bit of this promontory. Cool. That's what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Yep. Yeah, something perpendicular. Yeah. Oh, perpendicular well, to perpendicular to the to the slope to the, slope. To the contours. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know you could click and drag waypoints. Uh, Ray and I did not either. Elias showed Ray this yesterday. Wow, we learn new things every day. Right? Yeah, he works a lot with Hypac, um, and his or he has worked a lot with Hypac in his offshore life. Very cool. Right? Drag and drop high pack targets? Who knew? In 15 years, I did not know that. I, that's <laughs> so that's, yeah, that's a good example for. Yeah, <laughs> always learning. Always yep. learning. It sounds dangerous, though. You have to press another button, right, in order to drag them? Yeah, control. Okay. Can I zoom on the boulder here? Yeah. What do we call this, a drop stone? Mm, no, but okay. could be. <laughs> I mean, uh, highly doubt it. Oh, yeah, OK. No, no it's I not. see it's definitely it's not. It's definitely not, yeah. Too low latitude. Not enough glaciation here? Yeah. Mm. Last time, uh, I think these latitudes were glaciated was, OK. More than 500 million years ago. So is this what you're looking for, Steve? It's been a few years. Yep. Just Not that old. Looking for a quick, quick snap. Okay, go for zoom. Let's see if there's anything of note here. I don't see anything. Okay, let's go wide. 500 million years. So what was going on on the equator? We're in the tropics 500 million years ago. Uh, it'd be actually longer than that, probably maybe six or seven during the Ediacaran. There's this theory called snowball earth, um, which is kind of this unresolved idea that uh, most of the earth was covered in ice down to the equatorial area. And geologists and physicists tend to disagree on this uh, because if the earth was completely covered in ice, then uh, the idea from physicists is that it wouldn't uh, be able to thaw itself out. Uh, but we do see evidence of uh, things like drop stones and uh, things, uh, demictites actually is what they're called in certain areas, like in um, Death Valley, which are evidence of this, this really, really ancient glaciation period. Um, so the idea of snowball earth is, as it stands now is uh, most of the earth was covered in ice and uh, around, I think, 20 degrees north and south, it was considered a sludge or you know, like a like an icy mix of uh, water and slushy. Sl yeah, like a slushy. Yeah, mm. but uh, <laughs> it's a kind of a developing um, subfield of of uh, geology. So why wouldn't the Earth be able to thaw itself out if it was covered in ice? I, do I, you need that like land to absorb heat or something like I'm, that? I'm not sure, uh, to okay. be honest with you, but I think it has something to do with that. Yeah. Uh, like maybe just a feedback system of albedo and yeah, a few other systems. All of this mm -hmm. on yeah. And I don't think volcanism would be enough to thaw thaw the earth out by itself. And also at that time, the the sun didn't have the same intensity, so um, it was a few degrees cooler on average. Oh, that's really interesting to think about. You're talking about 600 million years ago. Uh, let me look. I should probably double check this. Our next move is going to be uh, 190. 190, roger. 
bridge now. Uh, five zero meters, one nine zero. So yeah, Snowball Earth was around 650 to maybe 725 million years ago. So that's, you know, 500 million years ago was the Cambrian explosion where you saw a high diversity of complex life. Uh, you still had eukaryotes around in this time and other simple life forms, but uh, gotcha. about 650 million wow. years ago. Yeah, global glaciation. The blue planet was a white planet. Like Enceladus? What's maybe? coming up? Almost, yeah. yeah. Uh, hold on. Something floating in the water coming right up. Fish. Interesting. Oh, well. Wow. Rat tail? Oh, yeah, rat it's probably foraging, looking for things in the sediment. It's a rat tail, grenadier. Go for zoom. Beauty. Yeah. Let's hold that for a few seconds if we can. This this shows you um, pretty much exactly how they feed. They have these barbels that they're probing the sediment substrate with, looking for and feeling for vibrations of animals that might be present in the sediment. Their eyesight, you know, although their eyes are large, they're probably not very useful at this depth but they're just station keeping while they move with the current. They can open their mouths and ingest in sediment and whatever uh, animals in the substrate pretty quickly. Almost like a vacuum. Yeah, just conserving energy floating around. Yeah, it's not, it's hardly moving, it's on its own. Okay, go wide. All right, good, great shot. Excellent. Good luck foraging. Bon appetit, buddy. <laughs> Hope you find something yummy. <laughs> Everything okay up there? <laughs> Not even sure where those fell from. <laughs> Clipboard falls from the sky. <laughs> Haunted van. Barclay Canyon access. Oh, and see. All right, Steve, there's somebody in the chat who desperately wants to know what happened with that coconut. So <laughs> if we could circle <laughs> back to that. Um, so you said that you did eventually find another coconut. You brought it on the ship, and then did you cut it open? Uh, I have to refer to the folks on 149. I believe they did cut it open. Sure did. Yeah, and it did have liquid inside? It had a coconut inside, yes. And liquid was, and solid. Was the liquid seawater, or...? Uh, I don't think so. So it was coconut juice? I don't know if it juice? was tasted, though. Depth-aged coconut Depth -aged. juice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Highly concentrated. Airspeed velocity of a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> probably the only, if you think about it, it's actually a really, really important thing. That's probably the only coconut that's ever re returned from the sea floor. <laughs> Very important. To the land of the sun, and uh, yeah, didn't work out. So, um, speaking of that rat tail that we just saw. Somebody wants to know, do they have any kind of sonar or electromagnetic fields that it uses to forage? So you did mention the barbels. Is there anything else that it uses in order to sense what might be in the sand? Uh, yeah, I'm not too sure about that. Um, fish biology is uh, something we rely on our scientists to shore about. Um, we don't often do a lot of fish sampling out here. And so uh, there are specific organizations with within NOAA that do fisheries research and um, you know, they, they do their own sampling. It's very hard to catch a fish with an ROV. So 
We don't often uh, know a lot about their biology, but the specialists would. I've seen it done a few times successfully. Yeah. Um, even like quite large fish, um, but you do have to build very special sampling equipment for it. Like very, basically a very, very big slurp jar with a very pow powerful slurp fan. Yeah. Like essentially a thuster. <laughs> They're actually a thruster, yeah. literally a thruster. A little cool. airplane engine. <laughs> yeah. I want to see that. Um, I, I have some pictures, actually. Yeah. We, we do get fish sometimes. Um, I was looking back through some old cruise photos. We collected a tripod fish and a slurp inadvertently in um, 20. We sampled a juvenile flatfish with this slurp. Yep. Really tiny one. Um, oftentimes when we're, when we're working at at or near hydrothermal vents, you get snailfish um, in the, the matrix of the vent community. So in between all the mussels and uh, worms, and they, they come up. Speaking of tri tripod fish, there's one up in the water column right now. Where Just top, right. Yeah. top uh, right. So if you drift up a little bit, you'll probably see it somewhere here. It was in the it was in the camera uh, triclops. Oh. oh, there you go. Oh, wow, wow. cool. Hi there. Normally don't see them in the water column. Yep, this is a tripod fish. Go for zoom. Oh. They normally orient um, pointed upslope towards the current, into the current, because they're ambush predators. Okay, there go away. <laughs> Yeah, that's my first time seeing one swimming. Yeah, me too. Neat. I like fishies. Oh, so Steve, I was, the question I was getting at earlier, many, many earlier, um, was on the sample list of the species that are potentially to be found in this depth range, what, uh, what kind of species are we still looking for that have not been collected yet? Uh, it's, it's really opportunistic at this point. Um, we don't have necessarily target corals. We're, I mean, broadly, we're looking for a few requests um, from scientists ashore, but there's no specific species that um, have been sent our way. Okay. You know, look out for this thing. So we're looking broadly for plexorids and paramarciids, which are not going to be found at this depth, only shallower than about 1,800 meters, perhaps. Right. Uh, we're also looking for sclerotinians, stony corals, and, and cup corals. Uh, black corals, so all of these broadly, uh, if they're representative of a site or potentially unusual, we'll aim to collect s some of them. Anything other than corals? Sponges. Uh, we have a few sea star uh, images that we were told to look out for, but most of them are substantially shallower. Right than a thousand meters, so not within the scope of the depths we'll be diving at. Um, and then also some 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 shrimp, especially, uh, we've been told to look out for shrimp that are associated with sponges, and we do have a couple of those from our sponge collections. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So for our viewers online who are just now tuning in, hello and welcome to the SPL, Science Party Line. Uh, this is the four to eight crew. This is Brittany speaking. And currently we are exploring an unnamed seamount in the northwest limit of the EEZ surrounding Johnston Atoll. 
Our current depth is 2,247 meters. And the current temperature is 1.9 degrees Celsius. So again, we're using two ROVs in order to conduct this dive. The main one that we're using is Hercules. And the sidekick for Hercules today is Atalanta. So you can see uh, the main feed that we have on channel one is the view from Hercules. And then on channel two, that is the view from Atalanta that is hovering above Hercules about 30 meters. Can we look upslope to the right a little bit? Just a quick peek. Getting back into some sheet flows. I think this is associated with this this bump here in the bathy. That's about as far up as I can see with Might want to grab a sample in this area if that's possible. Okay. We have rock sample time. I was about to say it's been 350 meters since our yeah. last rock collection. All right. Hello, our viewers from Michigan. Um, you're wondering how long the dive is today. Uh, can you, uh, Nick, do you want to keep pointing me? Uh, yeah, anywhere in this this field should be okay. fine. <laughs> this general area of Talos. <laughs> so we're looking at a 12-hour dive um, this time around, and we started we launched this dive uh, at midnight, 24, 2400. We can take bigger rocks too. We have two of the bigger bigger boxes open. Can you zoom down a little bit, please? Like that maybe. That one sounds good. I thought you were gonna go for the candy corn right in front. Yeah, I was looking at that one. <laughs> is that a candy is that a bigger corn. rock there? Yeah, I can do that one. Sorry, sorry, can we do a couple more turns like outside yeah. of this? The dust cloud cloud. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so there. Fifteen. At least. Yeah. Fifteen to twenty. Fifteen to twenty on the long axis. Okay. Yeah, that's good. That can go in on um, the forward star starward bow box. Okay. One of the smaller one. Sorry, what was that sample number? Yeah, 125. 125. Okay. I'd like to slice that one up. What's up? Oh, I was just calling dibs on slicing that one. <laughs> <laughs> Move is just complete in. Um, okay. Science, anything else we want to do here? I don't think so. Great. Thank you. Mm. I don't know if it's going to fit Let's in. Let's not put in a small yeah. another move until we see how this fits. Yeah. So I will not move fast with this open. Can I just put in E or F? Yep. In uh, E for, yeah, that's fine. Bridge, no? Five zero meter is one nine zero. It's fine. No? It's fine. Oh. We should be able to catch up. We can hold the move if we can. Yeah. 
It's been taking a few minutes to get out of the way to move it. All right, so we just collected a rock sample. I think that was the second or third one of this watch. A uh, third of our watch, yeah. Trump. All right, tramp. So yeah, Hercules, the um, the ROV that we're using in order to explore this seamount is equipped with multiple ways of collecting samples. So you're able to see Hercules using one of its claws in order to pick up that rock and place it inside of uh, one of the storage boxes. But in addition to that, we do use something called push core tubes. And so somebody online is wondering about those and um, how do we process the push core samples? The push cores have been a mixed success uh, on this cruise. So it normally our push cores will take uh, a few cores and hopefully some of them will yield some cohesive sediments, but that has eluded us. Um, for the most part, a lot of these sediments are pretty coarse and lack uh, kind of a biological you know, matrix of goo and ooze that <coughs> permits it to be cohesive. Um, so they slough out often, uh, but usually we, if we did get a good core, we would um, try to do two things. So we save one core, take, usually to try to take cores in, in pairs, save one core for uh, sediment stratigraphy, and then another core for um, biological sectioning. And for the biology, at least, we, uh, we preserve the top five centimeters. Uh, uh, for any animal life that might be found there. I haven't seen the pressure dive once. That's great. Yeah, I love it. Uh, Steve, can you elaborate on, uh, and I quote, the matrix of goo and ooze? <laughs> <laughs> That's where we live. That's where we live. We're all a part of the matrix. Uh, <laughs> So when you have marine snow that settles down to the seafloor, it carries with it all the sticky stuff that makes marine, s marine snow sticky, so like biofilms and bacteria. And these tend to become um, integrated into the sediments over time and creates a, a sticky, cohesive uh, matrix you know, in between the sediments that might build up, which are largely calcium carbonate foraminiferin shells or maybe, you know, silish, uh, you know siliceous uh, um, uh, shells of things like diatoms and other things that might fall with seafloor. So that cohesiveness, that muckiness of the, of the um, core uh, helps in some cases keep it together, uh, as well as fine grain sediments, much finer than uh, the, the larger foraminiferin shells we usually find that just lie on the surface. The hmm. answer does not disappoint. Thank you. Happy to help. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> here, stuck, trapped in this matrix of goo and <laughs> All of us together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not, 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 not the, uh, the yellow submarine we're all trapped in. <laughs> The Wait, matrix of Goonies. The opposite of the matrix of Goonies. <laughs> that the Doesn't first one didn't hit nice well. Song. Yeah, yeah, didn't hit well we by all the Beatles. Live in a matrix of yeah. Goonies. <laughs> matrix of Goonies. <laughs> Doesn't really roll off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sheet flows, huh? What can you do? Looks like. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a no lot. Push not here. much. And <laughs> <laughs> push cores. Might go so far to call this a low bait flow. Low bait. Okay. Mm. Is that an evolved sheet flow? It's a. It's no. It's not evolved. Oh, it's okay. just a slower, slower eruption. Good note to stop throwing out geology terms. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> I'm trying to get on next level. Yeah. I hate to do this, but uh, we're not we're not taking a sample. We're not gonna do it. <laughs> Wait, where? <laughs> 
the what? evolved lavas, uh, they're, they're typically in oh, those okay. settings, those sub uh, settings. Uh, I knew it was coming. Yeah. Gave you a warning. I did. <laughs> All right, now I'm getting irritated. Um. <laughs> Just now? Actually, it's pretty good. It's been a, it's been a few weeks. I know, that was really forced. I, I, don't, I don't feel good about that. Uh, can we back up a uh, chance so we have time? Like a uh, half a meter? There's something weird, like translucent in the rock right here. Oh, oh yeah. Do yeah. a quick zoom there. Oop. Yeah. Yep, there. Yeah, I see it. Is that part of the rock? No, I don't. If so, Is it's it? just a weird oh, part of the a, rock. It could be a bryozoan or an encrusting sponge. Okay, go yeah. away. Very nondescript, very difficult to be able to tell. Yeah. Bryozoan or sponge. Unclear. Bridge, no? Well, actually, it is clear, but translucent, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Uh, five zero meters, one nine zero, please. Steve, do you want to keep laddering along this contour, or would you prefer that we just head up slope? Yeah, that's what I'm debating internally right now. Yeah, I can mm. tell. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want this to disappear and go back into the into the, the sediment. Yeah. Um. Let's pause after the next move and see where we're at. Okay. This is more interesting. Follow your heart, Steve. Well, I actually have to follow the dive plan. So. <laughs> <laughs> you follow your what? Plan the dive, dive the plan, right? That's true. You put your heart into that dive plan, Steve. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> uh, somebody online wants to know, what is the average height of the gi... Giot. The giot <laughs> above the seafloor? Uh, of this particular guild, I'm not 100%. Uh, do we have that information in the dive plan, Steve? Uh, the summit's at 2,000 meters. 2,000 meters. So th I guess that would be close to the average. Uh, yeah. A guild is just uh, typically defined as any seamount that, through either erosion or subsidence, is uh, leveled off below the, uh, the sea water. The sea level? <laughs> sure. So a guillot was ab uh, at some point above that sea level. Yes, it, that's that was the traditional idea. There's there's been a few papers that have kind of challenged this idea that maybe uh, you just had a lava flow that might have stopped or might have uh, uh, formed the uh, seamount um, below the, the the sea level. Um, so uh, it's still something that we're trying to understand. But many of them are erosional or uh, due to subsidence of the crust that cools and uh, expands over time. Not expands, but uh, laterally. I think I just thought of our shift name. What's our shift name? Matrix yeah. of Goo and Ooze. <laughs> <laughs> did you think of that or did Steve? <laughs> All rights reserved. <laughs> All rights reserved. <laughs> Copyrighted our, that already. Mm -hmm. Yeah, someone online is saying Matrix of Goo and Ooze sounds like a musical group that plays new age or trance music. So <laughs> circling back to that restaurant idea, mm -hmm. I, think, I think you're getting some 
I, I told you I'm easy. playing chess back here. Wait, yeah. <laughs> New Age grilled cheese and nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> the question is, do they serve the grilled cheese late at night during the nightclub? Okay, yeah, of course. Yeah, that's the point. Yeah, <laughs> sure. But hey, question: What's going on with Deck Frog? Yeah, Deck Frog's looking kind of sad. Do we want to check in on Deck Frog? Yeah. yeah. Let's, I let's really zoom in. can't tell what the <laughs> What's going on there? Tech frog, oh no. I noticed that earlier too. Yeah, I noticed it when I uh, woke up and came out with my coffee. Do, like do we have a, is it a stressful launch or a. <laughs> I don't know. Else? I mean, I was asleep. Does someone want to give a quick description of, of Deck Frog to the people? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Throw it on. Can that, can that screen not go out? No, it can. No, it's going out. It's, it's on three now. Oh, okay. So Deck, Deck Frog is the... Uh, <laughs> 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 I feel like I need like, a scientific description of this. <laughs> we should ask a scientist. We have a what few. Is yeah, that's frog. true. <laughs> Do we have anyone who does amphibians? Yeah. No. Too much, oh, okay. too much backbone. Okay. Uh, Deck frog is the two fenders between the A-frame making <laughs> the eyes. <laughs> the mouth <laughs> is the attachment lines as, as Adelanta comes back on deck. Uh, and every day the deck chief makes the, the face a little different. But we're not sure about today's. Could be a tongue. I don't think they're very sure either, yeah. yeah. I think it's supposed to be a like uh, ambivalent face with a tongue out, actually. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Oh, it's cute. Oh, okay. Deck frog is nothing if not cute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Adorable. Oh, deck frog. Oh, deck frog. Oh, see you later, deck frog. Okay, we'll see you later for sunrise. <laughs> <laughs> Someone in the chat is asking, when do you find time to sleep? <laughs> uh, Can you tell? Do you hear our conversation? <laughs> <laughs> it's clear that we don't get enough. <laughs> uh, boy. Um, yeah, so we try to sleep when we have time available sometimes. Um, so we, yeah, all right, so these dives take hours to conduct, right? So this particular dive that we're on right now is a total dive time of about 12 hours. That's definitely on the short side. Uh, but we have watches that switch off every four hours. So this is the four to eight crew. And then there's going to be the 8 to 12, and then 12 to 4, and so on and so forth. Um, I'm actually quite awake today. Miraculously, yesterday was a struggle, but I got some good sleep last night, thank goodness. I might be the only one, though. Yeah, what's that like? <laughs> <laughs> I just finished my coffee, and we'll see if it works. <laughs> we, sleep, we sleep between watches, so yes. yeah. we get 8 hours between watches, which sounds great. Except for, it's not enough. You end up, it ends up being closer to five or six at yeah. a time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like you end up like eating a meal, going to the gym, having a chat, and then sneaking in some sleep. Usually a short sleep and a long sleep. Yeah. You got to do those other things like you know take a shower. Yeah. Sometimes. You know, yeah. Yeah. Science, <laughs> laundry, science. Science. More science. <laughs> science in there. Yeah, also science. Having more chats. <laughs> more, science. chats. Yeah. more science. More chats. Yep. science. Cutting rocks. <laughs> uh, hey, science. Uh, yeah. We are, uh, the ship move is complete. What are you thinking? I think, um, can you draw a line between here and waypoint 8A? Sure. I mean, 8A? That's 8A. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, can we do that? Is that a doable trajectory? What do you think, Gabby? <laughs> sure. Great. Just keep it slow, I guess. We don't have a lot of layback. It's not yeah. going to be... We're not in a rush. Yeah, I don't think... I think we can make our way up slowly and suck up our layback each time, even... Sure. And be able to sample and zoom and stuff like that. Sounds Which lovely. That's my... That's my optimistic outlook here. Great. Let's try optimistic. Uh, that'll be 250. Bridge, now. Huh? Five zero meters to five zero, please. Okay, coming up. Coming up. 
That's a waypoint, like sub point A, right? Not you trying to sound Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I was trying to figure <laughs> out. <laughs> Which point A? Which point A? Uh, there's something gelatinous here. Oh, it's a tunicate. Never mind. Okay. Uh, okay. Excited. Megalodicopia like. I'm sorry? I just, I'm very. <laughs> <laughs> what? What did you say? Megalodicopia? Yeah, that's what I thought. Megalodicopia? <laughs> like Megalo ish? Megalodicopia. Tunicate? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Predatory tunicate? <laughs> anyway, um. <laughs> yeah. This is one of those days. Steve, have you ever written a song to. The tune of Wonderwall? Or turned Wonderwall into I, a different. I was actually thinking about that earlier. Can we, uh. Do we have time to stop uh, and zoom here? And down in the yeah. lower left, we just passed it by yeah. about half a meter. Oh, it's on the lower yeah. face of the rock Three, that's kind of right here. Meters. Zoom in there. On this little white thing? Oh, yeah. yeah, underneath this, this rock there. Oh, okay. It's above the white thing. Project. I can see it in, in the Triclops very oh well. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you saw it's this. under the rock. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. Triclops actually yeah, can see under things, so which is is blows my mind. Star. It's a sea star. It's right, very we'll well. We oh, yeah, think a star maybe? yeah, it's it's totally hidden. You know, I we got a good shot in the Triclops, but I think it's a I think it's a slime star. Oh, okay. cool. Go ahead. Yeah. All right. We got some good photos on the Triclops at least. Okay. Great. Somebody's wondering how do we do laundry um, on the ship? Yeah, we do have uh, washing machines and dryers. So we've been on this journey for sure. yeah, I'm not sure what that is there. Twenty days almost. Um, anyway, so yeah, we cucumber. were able to do laundry on on the ship. We have a laundry van kind of a thing. Oh, Holotherian. Mm. Yep. Maybe? Yep. Cucumber, Holotherian. Juvenile? Uh, I don't know. No, I don't know. <coughs> Gotta go back in. It's very tough to, to gauge that. Great. Um, Can you throw on a couple more Atalanta lights? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Coming on. Can you repeat that name? The, okay. the name? Yeah. Uh, sea Cucumber, Holotherian. What do you think these uh, big carve-outs are? That's interesting. Um, again, I think it's just the lava uh, coming out of... Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's weird how you see the... Uh, like a little plateau that... solidified by itself.
So some of our online viewers are just now tuning in and they're wanting to know if there are any updates about the unknown translucent mollusk type thing that we slurped yesterday. Yeah, so um, we did make a collection of whatever that may be. And Steve, do you want to talk about the process that um, will happen in order to see if we can identify it eventually? Yep. Um, so we're sure. That'll give us just more time to bridge now. We're going to be um, sending the material to our biological repository at the Museum, of, uh, the Museum of Comparative Zoology at uh, Harvard University, and there okay. they will be um, curating the material and doing some uh, initial okay. work, uh, possibly a DNA barcode of the tissue that would allow us to place it at least within um, the tree of life, you know, and find its closest relatives um, evolutionarily. And uh, from there, uh, we should we should be able to better refine what it could be, or if it's something new, describe it. Probably a, a taxon specialist in that group, not, not us necessarily. It's interesting rubble. Yeah. Yeah, follow up question. Somebody is just now asking how we discovered any new species on these dives. Um, uh, yeah. Tilt up a little bit there. I thought I saw something on the side of the rock up here. Just a, just a meter. Can we zoom there, snap? Or okay. maybe that's part of the rock. Part of the rock, okay. Oh, there's a little squat lobster. There was a little squat lobster, yeah. Very small. Yeah, so I would say fairly regularly, we are um, making lots of new discoveries. So the deep sea is largely unexplored. And so we're just out here taking a look around, seeing what we can find and um, discover. And yeah, on a fairly regular basis, we're seeing new things. I remember hearing that the surface of Mars is okay, more understood right than our deep sea, so. Uh, Mars is super angular. Oh, yeah, that's a good yeah. idea to switch first. Yeah, that's like a perfect Big triangle. Big rock. <laughs> I think so. We do it at the same time, but. Totally. There's like a cool feature happening here, too. Science, uh, ship is holding position. Pilots are going to switch. Anything um, you want to sample in this area? No. Okay. Well, now that now that we're moving into some boulders, maybe, but uh, we can take a look at some of this stuff on the other side of the rock. Oh, look, there's stuff oh, on the other side of the rock. Oh, look at this. That's a big one. Gee whiz. It's a beautiful boulder. That's a beautiful boulder. <laughs> it is. It is a really big one. It is. I like it a lot. In Triclops Cam, it's gorgeous. Yeah. yeah. It's got some rough edges, but yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a little rough around the edges. It's a nice boulder, but look at that star. I think it's some charm. Uh, would you call this Botrodal? No. 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 Um, I don't know. Jagged. I don't know. Mm. Come on. There's got to yeah, be. Yeah. There's got to be, right? Um, Delightfully lumpy. Jumbled? Jumbled, jumbled, jumbled. Jumbled. Yeah. Someone online is asking about whale fossils. They went to this 
National Museum of Natural History and they were looking at a whale fossil and wondering if that was from a Nautilus dive. Um, I know that we have been finding beaked whale bones down here, um, just the, the beaked part. And I don't know if those are necessarily technically fossils. I think that I've been hearing that they're bones, but they're encrusted with a barrow-manganese crust, right? Um, but have we found any other whale parts that are actual fossils? Um, in the past, we have looked at um, whale, whale falls, which are very much fresh bone. Uh, but we, to the best of our knowledge, have not found fresh bone material out here in the Pacific Remote Islands. Uh, but it w the the specimen at the NMNH probably wouldn't it wouldn't have been uh, from Nautilus. I think the closest thing you'll have to fossilization would be a ferromanganese crust, um, typically in oxygen-saturated environments, you're not going to find any fossils. You'll need to have some type of quick burial and anoxic environment to really preserve any type of tissue, particularly soft tissue. Somebody wants to know why specifically are we doing these dives around Johnson Atoll? Um, so yeah. this uh, this project we're doing, this exploration, is a uh, part of a multi-year uh, exploration campaign throughout the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument and and surrounding monument um, uh, yes. surrounding monuments that include um, Papa Nomo Kukea, that, uh, just north of here, which will be the subject of the next expedition. But basically the goal is to explore the unexplored parts of the uh, remote Pacific, Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument. Um, most of the dives we're doing, in fact all of the dives we're doing, are on features that have never before been explored. and and some of them never before been mapped. And so that's our that's our charge for this expedition. Collect uh, si samples and observations of scientific uh, interest along our exploration path. Um, that helps supports not only the uh, advancing the science in the region, but also um, the management proposals and plans that uh, are being worked on uh, for each monument unit. In this case, we're focusing on Johnson Atoll and the sea mounts primarily surrounding the atoll. Um, but there's been an extensive amount of work closer to the atoll at shallower depths in the past uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, but most of these uh, sea mounts in the periphery have been either unexplored or, not, or uh, have depths that have not been characterized yet. How many uh, species would you estimate remain un unidentified uh, in the ocean's um, depths and, and shallow environments? Did, did uh, yep. Many. Sorry. That's a big question. Uh, many. Nice. Yeah. Two five zero. Yep. And one of the hopes of the expedition too is to like show the diversity of the region to maybe push towards sanctuary designation too, right? In a way, yeah, that process is, is ongoing. Um, so there's a few different levels of protection and, and designation that uh, we find in this area. This is a really interesting geological feature to the right hand side. Um, so we are now within the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument, which is one of five monument okay, units yeah. uh, throughout. U.S. jurisdictions in the Central Pacific. Yeah, testing one, two. Uh, however, uh, you might have heard that earlier this year, um, the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Monument was uh, proposed uh, as, uh, or 
the Pacific Remote Islands Marine National Marine Sanctuary.